So a uh, quick warning, y'all. I know I said that the Mavs, uh, I'd be panicking if the Mavs pick was in the top five. Obviously, I wouldn't really be panicking if the Mavs were in the top five. It was just like dumb, like thinking whenever I was saying that. So it would be like, you know, top eight or something instead of the top five. And then they didn't keep it. One final clarification I missed. Um, the Stepien uh, list that I mentioned that I use is not like just made by the Stepien. It's a compilation of the Stepien uh, boards of Mike uh, Gribanov and Jackson Hoy, but it also includes Mike Schmitz's board on ESPN. It also includes uh, Jonathan Wasserman's board on Bleach Report and also NBADraft.net. Welcome to the Third Round Picks podcast. I'm here with uh, Mike Bibbins, a.k.a. At MBibbs on Twitter, and Richard Stamen, a.k.a. at MazDraft, virtually. And uh, Bibbs, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. Much better than last week, I promise. Good to hear. Richard, how are you doing? Pretty good. Not on the road this time, so that's pretty Ooh. nice. <laughs> it's a major no victory. Connection. Yeah, no connection issues, hopefully. But my place is uh, known to just go out at times. So who knows? Let's say you just jinxed it. You just jinxed it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. We need that uh, meme where, like, the guy's, like, constantly raising the roof for, like, three old seconds. We need that meme right about now. Um, so on today's episode, we were th- going to take a look into this year's class and uh, some guys who we are going to start throwing out some labels prematurely. And definitely too early. So just like hot takes, I guess you could say, but definitely can be changeable throughout the season and throughout like the next five years, which is a bib strategy of uh, re-ranking drafts, one that I very much support. Um, so some clarifications from uh, last episode. Number one, uh, when I say like I want a defensive wing over a backup point guard in most situations. Um, I suppose I should say it's not because backup point guards aren't better than defensive wings because they even can be. It's just the thing is it's so easy to find a backup point guard, like even a good backup point guard. Like it's easy. Like if you have a good system and you can find a pretty decent backup point guard, like how many good backup point guards are in the league? Like, there's a good amount, right? Can we agree on that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, there's a good pack of point guard on, like, most decent teams and even a good amount of bad teams. Like, the Mavs were a bad team last year. I had a great backup point guard and a great third point guard. <laughs> and fourth. No, <laughs> yeah. We know. Fourth, Yogi Ferrell. You just overdo it at the point guard in Dallas. So. Yep. I mean, you know, Warriors, Sean Livingston, uh, Sacramento Kings, if you call Bogdanovich a point guard, you could, even though he started, you could say he's a backup point guard. Um, I have a hot take on what? Bogdanovich, too. <laughs> I was going to say Bogdanovich, will, All right. uh, he's a pure, like, he's a good secondary playmaker, but I wouldn't call him a point guard of any kind. Yeah, I wouldn't call him a point guard, but you could quote unquote like the same way Culver might be called quote unquote a point guard, even though he's not really a point guard. He's like a like an off guard that can play make still. So, like I don't know, or at least that's what he was last year. I haven't watched lots this year yet, so we'll see how he's changed this year. He's been playing pretty well, so we'll get to that later. Um, you see, we can move on to. Uh, Another clarification, I think I should say. Uh, I mentioned the Red Team. The uh, the Red Team is this podcast that I really enjoy with uh, a bunch of people uh, that work for the 94, uh, like Alex West, uh, Stacchio, Ruli, uh, Connor Har, and then this guy that runs his own website named Josh Earl. Um, I really support them, and they've also supported us with feedback early on so i really appreciate that from them and that's why i brought them up on accident because they were i was listening to their podcast like a couple of days earlier it was like well this is how you fight against somebody in an argument you say i'm taking the red team approach and that's what that means is whenever you're just automatically taking the anti to something um 
And that's the uh, main clarifications. Uh, Bibbs, you want to move on to your like early takes on the uh, this year's well not this year's but the last year's draft class or this year slash this year's rookie class um i, I think we can do like a you, want, you guys want to do like a rapid fire or you just want to go down a list or um i don't know richard how you feeling down the fire or, i'm sorry down the list and combine the two <laughs> starting with eight Aiden. yeah i guess right start pick one yeah all right. Um, so, first impression, DeAndre Ayton. He is what I thought he was. Uh, his, his numbers are going to look fine. He's going to score. He's going to get rebounds. But as far as his actual impact on the game, uh, you can't really say he's changed much in Phoenix. Um, any disagreements there? <laughs> uh, not really. I just want to add that I personally was not a fan of DeAndre Ayton. So, uh, Seeing him get uh, crossed up by Darren Collison was a little funny for a minute. And uh, also, he has his own... He's like DeAndre Jordan the same way where he has his own clips where you're screaming at him for not playing help defense. So, uh, that's cool. But um, I'm not I, I'm not personally against DeAndre Aiden. I just don't necessarily like him as a player. DeAndre is nothing personal, buddy. <laughs> I like him. I'll, I guess I'll go out from minority here. I uh, I love what he's done. I think he's averaging like what fifteen and ten. I don't think I think he's still got a lot of areas to improve on. But at the end of the day, he's still a rookie and he's putting up fifteen and ten. He's one of the best divers in the league. I think he's really really good in the pick and roll, and I'm a big fan of that. And his playmaking has been pretty solid as well. I think obviously rim protection and the effort there is same thing as Arizona with the uh, just not trying to not caring. I, I would say he still right. tries. But just not caring to protect the rim, but That's exactly. He's, how uh, I put it. <laughs> but I'm I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan, so far, at least. <laughs> Bigger right. than y'all. That's for sure. <laughs> and so my thing with Aiton is, um, I compared it to like Carl Anthony Towns, where, like, you look at the numbers and you think, wow, this guy's killing it. But when you actually watch the game, like, I personally, I feel like he does, he, he does the the bare minimum. And I know it's hard to say somebody's doing a bare minimum when they're average, averaging 15 and 10, but, like, he's scoring on easy looks, like, wide-open looks. Uh, he's getting rebounds that come to him. He's getting blocks that come to him. Like, he's not chasing down somebody and blocking them. Um, he's not, yeah. like, hustling down the court, making a move and getting a, a bucket um, or, like, rebounding out of his area. That's what I mean when I say, like, I, he's like one of those empty stat guys in my opinion. Um, he's going to put up numbers. He's going to get all-stars, but in, unless something clicks for him as a competitor, um, I think he's, I mean, he's Carly, he's going to be a Carl Anthony Towns type to where in the playoffs, I don't, I don't see him doing anything if he ever gets there. <laughs> yeah, but the jury's still on Carl Anthony Towns, so we'll hold out a little bit on that. Right. Um, pick number two, Marvin Bagley, another guy I was not a big fan of. Um, he's not starting still, right? Last check. I think Bielitsa has beat him out. Hmm. Hey, to be fair, Bielitsa had a really start hot start to the year. Yeah. But Bagley's been, like, even in his limited minutes, he's still putting up pretty dang good numbers. And he's playing yeah. good defense. Like, all things considered, he's a good defender. Yeah, he's been playing pretty well when he's been playing. It's just, it's, it's like an interesting situation because you're like, the Kings are suddenly good again, and Marvin Bagley is not starting, and he's not being like Mr. Fantastic that some people thought he was, but not the, definitely not the consensus that he was Mr. Fantastic. But, you know, he's nice to see him make a contribution off the bench in a team that's, you know, fighting. We'll see how long that lasts, though, with the fighting part. <laughs> I think it's legit. I mean, he's shooting 33% from the three. Um, obviously, shooting such still has a ways to go. But, like, his game is translated pretty clean. Like, everything that happened in Duke, like, it's pretty similar. Like, he's only playing 24 minutes a game, and he's averaging, I think, 13 and 6 or something like that. Yep. So he's 12.76. Yeah. So he's been – he's still doing really good. I also saw the only two – there's two – I think there's two or four – guys in the top 10 that have a positive net rating like offensive rating minus defensive rating 
and those the first two that we talked about, Bagley and Aiden, are two of the few that have done that. I know the other one is Bomba, which is incredible. I think it said something about the bigs having an impact, but <laughs> really amazing because. I mean, you look at like Trey Young, he's a minus 23 or something like that. So it's really interesting to see the difference of the rookies, like how much of an impact rookie bigs can have on the stat right. sheet and impacting the game. Yeah, I just want to say, I don't mean how long Bagley's good play will last. I'm referring to uh, the Kings trying to win games. I don't oh, know no, how long no. it's going to last. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't, I, don't, I don't think it came across that way. I just... Uh, right. With Bagley, I mean, he's he's definitely a positive end in that. He's not, you know, putting up empty numbers. Like, there's a lot of times Aiden is putting up some empty numbers, you know, but I haven't yeah. seen that with Bagley. No, definitely. I think Bagley's a guy that is who he is. Like, he's an energy big. Um, his points are coming off hustle um, and his rebounds as well. Like, he, he he's a good guy right now, I think, on a team that's fighting for the playoffs to come off the bench and keep that second unit energized. Uh, so I, I, he's, again, par for the course for what I expect from him. All right. Well, this is where we have our freakout session. Number three, Luka Doncic. Uh, Richard. A.K.A. A.K.A. what? Let's hear it. <sighs> Wonder uh, Boy. Got, got two, uh, is it Wonder Boy? You going with Wonder Boy? Wonder Boy until he's Wonder Man. Luca Legend is another one. Uh, Swaggy LD. <laughs> Swaggy LD. That's that he that, took that nickname in a, as a joke. <laughs> like seriously, it's on his well, basketball yeah. reference profile. Oh man, that's 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 disappointing. He was a joke though. He was being sarcastic. I'll take it. I'll take it. But yeah, I'll, go, I'll let you guys go ahead. All right. Um. Well. On the tape, you can see like the step backs are, of course, incredible. But he's, I think the big thing with him is he's like some people were saying, he might take a little while to figure out what he can actually get away with, like with what passes he can take that are skipping from, you know, corner to corner, cross courts, this sort of stuff, or like, uh, you know, fitting it in in between this like tiny little space to the inside cutter, stuff like this lob passes that he thinks he can get away with that obviously he can't get away with you know stuff like that it'll take a little time but other than that most of the turnovers i'm not having any major issues with they're like he's being too aggressive and he like loses control of the ball driving inside or like a couple times it's because teammate drops pass or just was poor communication stuff like that or traveling carrying offensive fouls stuff like that you know um right the free throws rebounded, which is huge because if he didn't get his free throws together, I would have freaked out. Um, the clutchness of Luka Doncic is real, people, but he still his field goal percentage has been a little bad in the past ten games. But I can't really complain whenever we're winning games. So, uh, Richard, I uh, I've liked what I've seen. I just uh, lately, of course hasn't been as great despite the 11 points in a row but because it felt like the first three quarters he was pretty non-existent the other night against um houston it felt like he was pretty non-existent in that game but of course it was nice to see him step up when it mattered most and he won dallas the game but the the thing i've had an issue with is him just kind of not really knowing how to control himself there's a lot of times where he just really loves dribbling into uh, into double teams and thinking, you know, that he's suddenly got like all the handles in the world to beat like triple teams and everything. So he kind of needs to let the game come to him in that aspect. Um, Also not a fan of his assist to turnover ratio. It's like barely over one, but other than that, no, he's been awesome. His shooting has translated so much better than I thought it would. And yeah, I mean, if this is him at his worst, the Mavs got a good deal. (laughs) Oh yeah. And especially with that pick is like, you know, 12, 14, 15, you know, I'm very happy with that. But, you know, if the Mavs were bad for whatever reason this year, it was a top five pick. I would have been a little more salty that, you know, we couldn't pull off the West Matthews and Kemp Bazemore deal. Um, no Bibbs, how are you feeling? Well, um, as you know, I wasn't a huge Luka guy coming mm-hmm. out. Um, I mean, you can go back to my earliest statements about him. I, I said he kind of reminded me of a big Steph Curry. 
when people were doubting his athletics athleticism, I should say. Um, <clears throat> he has uh, done pretty much most of what I thought he would do. His three point shooting has been better than I expected. Um, I think he shot he shot barely over thirty percent last year in Europe, and he's shooting thirty eight percent right now in the NBA from three. Um, I think his his handles and his craftiness are coming from mostly his confidence. Um, and I think that's what makes him a special rookie is that he's not, he's not going to have a bad game and then think too much about it, which I think a lot of rookies do. Um, or even like during the game, he's not going to get like spiral out of control because he's having a bad start. Uh, like we saw the other night. Um, and again, that's what makes him special. That's what's got me calling him the Luviana monster. And, uh, I don't think there's any doubting whether or not he's destined for, for greatness right now. Yeah, I don't think you can doubt him with that, with just how inc- insane he is. Like, um, you know, I remember there was this uh, the story about uh, Rolando Blackman with, like, the confidence baby. I think Luka Doncic <laughs> is that on every, like, single possession right now. It feels like, I don't know, maybe a bit too much, though, because sometimes it just feels like he just, like, dribbles and does nothing. For like ten whole seconds, JJ Barea impression, which is uh interesting because we all know the stories about him being called a six foot seven, six foot eight JJ Barea, and uh, yeah. in that specific that aspect, he's uh <laughs> it's a little true, but not particularly. I think I wasn't too mad with the Houston game because he had a lot of like he had like at least three hockey assists like in like the first like. 14 minutes or something and like even though he didn't get normal assists he had a lot of good passes that just ended up being another pass off or like a couple that were just straight up misses by Harrison Barnes and those sorts of dudes were like you can't guarantee he's gonna make the three um but yeah he did have a couple bad possessions with dribbling out the clock and just doing nothing and then he would have a couple other good possessions where he uh had like an open three just straight up missed or like he had one where it just rolled out of the rim on a layup and it's like it was a decently crafty layup and you're just like oh that should have gone in and like two it was at least two where he uh, was switched on to clint capella and like um he just missed a step back so it wasn't the worst it just didn't end up working out as a result very well right and if i can go back to what richard said about like some of his, his turnover issues and things like that um I think that's a, actually a, for a guy that plays like he does, I think that's a good thing to have early because it means he's trying things. And because we know he's a smart player, I think over time that'll correct itself as he figures out, okay, I can't make that pass against a guy with an eight-foot wingspan and stuff like that. Um, and I, I'm just going to be interesting to watch how that goes over the course of the season to see if we can slowly start to see that that change as the season goes on versus it taking a while for him to figure out those things. Yeah. But you know, I think he's figuring out a little bit day by day by day. I mean, we've had a couple games where like he's actually run at point Luca where he's asked to be the assist man a bit more often. And you'll see he's like six assists, two turnovers. And it's like, that's a good assist to turnover ratio. Why hasn't that been a thing in his normal games? And I think it's just because when he's asked to carry on the scoring load, he ends up turning the ball over because he's a bit too aggressive with what he does or he ends up getting stripped or something like that so i'm not too worried about the turnovers i think it's natural and hopefully it'll fall down below like three and a half eventually (laughs) like this year (laughs) um number four my boy jaron jackson jr all right, Richard, why don't you start? Jackson's been impressive. Um, I missed the game of his career so far last week while I was at the Oregon game, so I'm a little bit disappointed in that. But, I mean, he's still – I mean, he is doing everything as advertised. The foul trouble still plagues him every once in a while. Um, that may not have been I, – I thought that was a lot of just college ball being unbelievably soft. But he is definitely over-aggressive at times, but I love what he's done. I mean, how can you not? He's – Becoming that jack of all trades, kind of a master of some, not necessarily, you know, everything, but he can clearly do everything, at least at a at the NBA level, which is really, really impressive. So I think, you know, Memphis has found themselves their cornerstone big 
once Marcus Saul retires. So good for them. That was uh, that was a really successful draft already for him. Yeah, and you see on uh, draft Twitter, there's already calls among like the more, uh, I guess you could say like a uh, hipster draft community is one way you could describe it, saying uh, Jaron Jackson is better than Luka. Like, not better right now, but like it's going to be better than Luka and all this. And it's a fair argument, but I'm not sure how that's going to work out. It just seems like both of these guys are destined to have great careers if they can keep up the sort of uh, play that they're doing right now. I will say I'm going to be uh, celebrating the fact that I really like Jaron Jackson and seeing him play well ever since the first game of Summer League. is like, I'm going to drop eight. It was like, what, eight of 13 on threes? That was yeah. beautiful. And went, I immediately went, went to town on Twitter being like, and uh, who said Jaron Jackson Jr. didn't have three point range? Uh, yeah, that was a that was a good time. But uh, I think the crazy part is that you see him pick up these like thirty six points versus the Nets, and then you look at the tape and it's like a lot of these are just like hustle plays, like they're just like putbacks and you know stuff yeah. off rebounds and like you know three pointers. But like then you see him go down the block and you see him create something that like he's like I've seen him do this maybe two or three times at Michigan State, if even. And it's just nice to see him, like, turn flashes that I saw, like, a couple times into reality now. Right. And I'll say um, I had to learn that Michigan State, Kentucky, uh, those those two teams in particular have been hard for me to evaluate players from historically uh, just because of the way the coaches handle their players. Um, usually you'll find, you'll see them doing things they didn't do in college once they get into the league. But uh, Jaron has been impressive. I think um, I do agree he's on on the path. But I'm not seeing this this Luca versus Jaron stuff. I don't see the point in that getting involved in that. <laughs> um, can they both be good? Yeah, it's like the Luca versus Trey is like this. Like except the difference is right. Luca versus Jaron is all like product of play, whereas. Luca V. Trey is all stories, so right, right. I like paying attention to it, but I'm not going to partake in the actual conversation, of course. Right. <sighs> Number five, Trey Young on Bibbs. <laughs> That's a smooth transition there for you. Um, but uh, Trey, um, I'm, I'm, I might be different than you guys, or maybe we'll be on the same page, but... I'm I'm definitely different from the consensus. I don't think he. I'm not ready to call say that he's it was a bust or uh, it's tough for me to even get involved in the Luca versus Trey conversation, um, just because I think he is in a good situation for himself. Um, I mean, he's averaging 15 points a game. Like you can, his shooting is horrendous. Um, just to actually put numbers behind it, 37 percent from the field, 24 percent from the three. Um, which I will say that's that's shocking almost. Um, I don't know if it's a product of being on a bad team and trying to do too much. Um, but John Collins is now starting to play, so his reasons for taking ridiculous shots uh, are going to start to decrease, and then eventually I'm going to not give him the excuse of being on a bad team. But overall, again, my five-year uh, drawn-out conclusion on him I still think he's going to be a really good player um I think his assist numbers will and his scoring will will start to level out over time yeah I think my main issue with the entire situation there's only really one is that I'm not sure what Lloyd Pierce is doing to like other than letting him chuck shots and I'm not sure he really has a choice but like if he had Mike Budenholzer still, I think Mike Budenholzer could make Trey look a lot better than what he's looking like right now. Like actually figure something out for him instead of kind of this shot chucking experience we're getting right now. But, you know, hopefully he can live and learn from it and, you know, get better. He hasn't been too bad in any other area. Like he's been pretty good as a playmaker on film and yeah. I've been liking that a lot. It just the shots are inconsistent and they're kind of wild and crazy and that's kind of what you're going to expect for now. He's like um, he, he's like the way he's gunning. It kind of reminds me a little of like how like the reputation at least of Mahmoud Abdul Raouf like he was gunning and gunning and gunning. So 
and like he was even like he wasn't really a playmaker in compared to like Steph Curry, but Trey Young is like an actual playmaker. So at least he has that going for him. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't have the defense that like a Steph Curry has, which is um, one major thing that's making him look even worse than he uh, already is looking. But all in all, I think it's just he's going to look bad for maybe even two years. He might have a sophomore slump again if Atlanta can't do anything. If Atlanta lands Zion Williamson, hopefully that can help him a lot. Um, Richard? So with Trey Young, I uh, he's, he's a weird one. I, I've had a lot of thoughts on him. I think the main one is how atrocious of a defender he is. We kind of knew he'd be, everyone knew he'd be a bad defender like that. That was no question. But between that and not actually being able to hit successful shots, which I, I think a large portion of it is just an unfamiliarity with the offense and uh, adjusting to NBA length and defenses. But a lot of times when in college he would get matched up against superior defenders, that are NBA talents, like when he got matched up against uh, Colin Sexton, he ate his lunch. If I'm not mistaken, against Iowa State, he had a pretty bad game against Nick Weiler Babb, who I think is an NBA caliber, at least like he'll be on the map guard, and he's a really long guard. I think that's just really hurt him. Like he hasn't been able to adjust to the length a lot of times. So he's got a lot of learning to do. I think he still needs to put on a lot of muscle. It'll help him become a slasher. Um, at times that his best games are when he can get to the lane and when he can't get to the lane because teams just play him so tight, that's when he just becomes ineffective. He's taking these bad shots. So I've, I've been underwhelmed, but I think there's still hope. I think a guy like him isn't just going to magically put up 25 and five, you know, every single night on 50, 40, 90, you know, especially on a team like Atlanta. Right. 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 And I, I'd love to, I haven't watched that many Hawks games. I watched one last night, um, against Denver. I guess it wasn't last night by the time this comes out, but I watched the game first Denver and I didn't see as much of the Trey Young Collins action as I would have liked to see. I think tr- I loved John Collins coming out of Wake Forest because of his ability to be that role man, and I didn't see it utilized that much. I think that's a combo that could be absolutely lethal. Right. Yeah, agreed. And uh, that's one thing where it's just like, there's always going to be this thing where you see these players have these specific skills and then they don't get utilized and you're screaming at your TV. And uh, I think I could say the same thing for a certain period of time where Luka Doncic wasn't being run very much in pick and rolls with DeAndre in the beginning. And like that was making me scream. It only happened like once or twice in like the first preseason game. And then on top of that, we had the whole Wes Matthews uh, trying to become a scorer in that game. That was ugly. Um, moving on to pick number six, we have Mo Bamba. You had to do it. You had to do it. Oh, I I'll did. Go first, I'll go first on this one since I, I am kind of partial to Orlando. Uh, I haven't seen... <laughs> Like, I, I think he's exactly what I had expected him to be, which is just a raw big who, you know, he's going to put up some good numbers every once in a while. I think his first game was really solid or second game, something like that. But completely inconsistent. I don't think it's a worrying kind of inconsistent um, for a guy who's so raw, you expect it. And he's still playing fine. Uh, there really hasn't been anything that's worrisome long term for him. So that's really good. If he can stay healthy, he's going to have a successful rookie year. Because for me, a successful rookie year for him is honestly setting himself up to have a successful sophomore year because that's going to be his true rookie year where he's playing 20-something minutes a game and actually getting more touches outside of being the fifth option, you know. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of what I've seen. I don't know if I see the superstar upside, you know, like the Gobert with a jump shot. I, I still hated that comparison. And uh, <laughs> no offense, Bibbs, but uh, I don't know if you were the one that used it. I think we talked about that. Um, I think that's on a the, the podcast, but but I, I never saw the the Gobert with a jump shot. I think he still could be anywhere from a Dwayne Dedman to like a Hassan White side. I still stand by that. And, and this year he's oh, off to a good start. I don't see anything that really has derailed that. So that's my thoughts on him. Well, uh, I think 
maybe we could mix a little bit of that together, considering how Deadman has finally put his shot together, and say uh, maybe his ceiling is like Hassan Whiteside with a Dwayne Deadman jump shot. <laughs> that sound good? I don't know. I like it. I mean, do, they both have uh, like Deadman and Whiteside have underrated wingspans. Like they both have seven seven wingspans. So I was I looking know. like last year at the draft, or I guess this year at the draft, I was looking at the wingspans of the top guys in the NBA, like top wingspans. And I was like, really? These guys all have seven seven wingspans, seven six. So I was kind of just trying to draw comparisons initially off them and see if there's anything uh, similar in their games. And I think Deadman and Whiteside both have a lot of similar qualities to Bamba. Very yeah. I think uh, Bamba, he's been playing decently well for, you know, how raw I thought he was. And I can't say that he's like playing below or or above expectations. He's playing about how I expected him, and that's why I wasn't particularly high on uh, Bamba. I, I I was messing around putting him somewhere in between like seven or eight and twelve, like somewhere in between there. But like it was it was kind of fluid at that point. Like it was not set in stone or anything. Uh, Bibbs, how are you feeling about Bamba? All right, so going back, uh, you guys kind of called me out there a little bit. Um, I definitely still, <laughs> still <laughs> I, I, I'm still in love with Bamba. Um, he uh, he's one of my five year guys, and I think just going forward, I'm gonna do a list of who I think is gonna like. I'm gonna rank players that I think are gonna be the best in five years, and then I'm gonna also do like an immediate impact list so I can kind of avoid a lot of the conversations I have to deal with for the first few years of his career. Let me interrupt you. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> what I was saying was not an insult to you. That was to other places that I will not name, but different <laughs> uh, NBA draft sites that do lazy comparisons. That's all. It was not an insult to you. Trust all me. Right. <laughs> I, I, I believe you. I trust you. Uh, but yeah, like I, what I've seen with Bamba, and it's, it's tough because the other guys that we've named have all had a chance to start for the teams that they're in. Meanwhile, Bamba's gone to Orlando where Vucevic has decided to be one of the top five centers in the league all of a sudden. Um, And it's probably going to be an all-star this year. Um, And so he's having to play behind him. He's averaging 17 minutes a game. Um, Yeah. And he's had a few games where he's come in and completely changed, changed the game offensively and defensively. Um, I think his jump shot looks better than I expected it to already. Um, you know, there were those videos that came out ahead of the draft showing him in the, the gym and everybody was, oh, this is an empty gym or he's shooting over a six foot tall guy, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think anybody's, I mean, he's shooting 34% from three and 49% from the field. That three point percentage is higher than everybody ahead of him, except Luca that was named. Uh, and then Colin Sexton, there's a few guys behind him that are shooting better from three, but the point being said that shooting 34% from three from a seven-foot guy is pretty good. Um, he does have to put on weight before we can start saying he's going to be a superstar. Um, I think if he was starting, he'd be putting up decent numbers, but I don't think he'd be a guy that's being talked about as the rookie of the year necessarily. I still have a lot of hope for his upside, though, but it's going to, again, still be on him gaining that weight. Yeah, I think my thing with Bamba was always, I'm never the guy that's going to bet on a guy that's uh kind of raw and like doesn't have necessarily the best instincts and stuff like that. And that's why I was high on uh, Jaron Jackson because he had all those instincts. And just because he was so, he's so young. Like he is so young. And he, and he still has all these like uh, intuition on defense and he has a three-point shot and it's quick it's not granny slow um yeah it's kind of like that with mo bamba last thing on bamba and his impact immediate or future uh one thing i noticed because i did watch a lot of orlando games early in the season um i kind of dialed off after i realized Vucevic wasn't going anywhere anytime soon um, <laughs> but bamba he often sets like a amazing pick and roll or pick and either gets left wide open on the three-point line and doesn't get a pass, or he'll set a good pick, roll to the basket, and, like, have nobody in front of him. But for whatever reason, the guard that's 
he's uh, screening for doesn't realize that he can throw it over the top to a guy with an eight foot wingspan. Hmm. And so that annoys me often. Um, it's that, that is DJ Augustine in a nutshell. He does that with everyone. It is, it's been frustrating. <laughs> right. Like it's like really do like just put it anywhere near the backboard slash rim area. If there's nobody in front of him, it's the dunk. Yeah. Like what I was saying, uh, preseason, I was like, the magic should be the team trading for Dennis Schroeder. And they could have done it. Like I think a Vucevic for Schroeder trade theoretically could have happened, but it didn't. And I think it's working out for the magic at least because Vucevic has just been so good, but I don't know how well that'll be for the future because Vucevic could be in a different uniform uh, next season. Sorry. (laughs) No, no, don't worry about it. I'm not offended. Uh, No, really quickly, just to kind of round this out with Bomba, but also explain the situation. Um, I mean, I get not getting a point guard this offseason. I also really don't because their biggest (laughs) offseason point guard signing was Isaiah Briscoe. Um, But DJ Augustine, I I think Orlando has made it clear they've they're trying to get rid of their cancers in the locker room over the last few years. The the um, Hennigan stuff is just it needs to it needs to all be pushed away. Pretend the, the five years, four years, whatever it was before just didn't exist. And uh, Schroeder kind of has some character issues. Uh, also legal trouble. I think they just wanted to stay away from that. Even if he would have helped on the court because Orlando wasn't trying to win games. But they're also like, hey, you know, if we win games, we'll keep going. But they're clearly not going to make any buying moves. So I think it's okay where they are. It helps them tank, and DJ's a really good locker room presence. And I think he's really helpful with getting guys involved uh, kind of in an odd way. But, like, as soon as he leaves, guys don't take their touches for granted. So everyone's getting it, and it kind of makes it work in a weird way. So that's just my two cents on the magic. We can move on to the next prospect. <laughs> okay. I will I will go with my 10-second one. Morning. I swear I saw like a report from like a verified like not just verified on Twitter but like someone that is like trustworthy. I think it was I think it might have been Woj. He was like the Magic won to make the playoffs this year. I was like please no, please don't do that. And I was like well if they actually do have that mentality then they should have gone for Schroeder or Isaiah Thomas or somebody because Thomas didn't get paid anything and I'm sure he would love to pick up that bag because he wanted those brain trucks. But you know. Whatever. Moving on to the seventh pick, another one of my guys, Wendell Carter Jr. Uh, Unfortunately, the Bulls have been kind of, I guess you could say, hot and cold this year, where, you know, if Zach Levine drops like 40 points, they'll win the game, but otherwise they're losing. Um, But Wendell Carter's played about how I've expected in pretty much every aspect, and I think he still can be maybe that Boston Al Horford type of guy. But, you know, right now it's early, and it'll be interesting to see how he'll adjust to uh, Jim Boylan, not Jim Boylan, Jim Boylan's system, uh, especially considering how there's apparently already beef with uh, Jim Boylan in the locker room. But that's also just reports. Um, Hopefully he can get his three-point shot together. Sorry. Oh, no, you're okay. Go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I w- hopefully he can get his three-point shot together, but it, I'm not too ma- worried about it yet just because Al Horford took a really long time before he was a good shooter. Yeah, I was just going to say um, I like his shot. They really – teams don't uh, respect it that much, which is kind of surprising considering he was he's still capable. But I was going to say that uh, the Bulls it, – it's – Wendell was put in a really, really bad situation. I almost feel worse for Chandler Hutchinson. But seeing all of this unfold 25 games into your career where you're in a group text saying, is it worth even going to practice? That's kind of messed up. So hopefully Wendell can be a leader. That's a huge, that's a huge step for him is to become a leader of just a broken locker room. And uh, I, I love what he's done. Though. I mean, he's got all these tools on the, on the court. I mean, he's already one of the best defenders of the – he's probably the best rookie defender in my opinion. Um, He's just been so good on that aspect. He's a good playmaker. I, I like everything he's done. He's on track to be a really good player, like just a solid glue guy almost, like the bona fide glue guy. And um, 
yeah, I really like what he's done. I think they've got a good piece. It just, like I said, all comes down to the locker room leadership. Yeah, I think there's a probably it uh, might be. Yeah, a Wendell, he's yeah. in a tough spot. Yeah, he is in a tough oh, spot. Good. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I was I was like preparing this comment as soon as he said <laughs> Wendell Carter's the best defender right now. I was like, there's I'd say it's it might be a pretty close battle between him and Jaron Jackson just because Jaron Jackson's got the monster blocks and all this and that. So that would be uh, an in- it's going to be an interesting thing to t- keep track of how Jaron and Wendell are doing compared to each other. Speaking of monster blocks, how about that? Yes. Wendell block on Westbrook yes. the other night. <laughs> I was going to say that too. Yeah, that was nasty. Like his ability to go just vertical without going sideways, like just going perfectly vertical, is just unreal to me. You don't see that out of a rookie right away. I mean, that's right. That's incredible. Yeah. And that's- Going when I was scouting them last year, oh, actually I was initially scouting Bagley because I didn't realize Carter was supposed to be a top guy initially um, for the draft anyway. And I was just question. I had to ask the question like, is Wendell Carter the best big in the draft? Just because he seems so smart and cerebral on defense and offense, and he's not necessarily going to block those shots, but his verticality is amazing. Like his ability to just get there and be in the way. Um, and that's that's the difference he's gonna make. You just hate to see it being sucked into the black hole that's happening over up in Chicago. Yeah, it's kind of tragic, a little bit. But hopefully the Bulls can get something out of this draft and you know start moving forward instead of losing again. Um, moving on to pick number eight, we have one of the guys that I was not a fan of, Colin Sexton. <laughs> I'm, I was a fan of him. I'll go. I'll I'll lead this one. I was a huge fan of him. Once I uh, I went to the Alabama LSU game in January. Uh, I guess this year it's still throwing me off. I'm sorry. I went to uh, that game and I think he put up a two for fourteen. And I was so blown away. That was his worst performance of the year, and he was like just miles away the best prospect on the floor. And I think I brought that up last week as well, but I will bring that up every week if I have to. Um, but Colin Sexton, the, his ability to get to the basket is unreal. His big hit or miss point is just going to be that pull up jumper. And it's been really hitting for him lately. So if he can consistently hit that pull up jumper, he's hard to stop. Cause you know, he's going to be able to get to the basket at will. And if he's able just to stop on a dime and hit it, hit a mid range shot, that's pretty lethal too. Yeah, it's pretty fair to say he's been playing better than how I felt about him. But, you know, he's kind of in the same situation as uh, Trey Young is in terms of like being able to do whatever he wants, because now that Kevin Love is out, he can pretty much literally do whatever he wants, Um, because I don't know how tight that leash is going to be from Ty Lue, considering how um, he's not Not ever had a reputation. Yeah, let's say never heard of a tight leash reputation from a Ty Lu. No, but, no, he's not coach, man. You know that. Oh, he's gone. Oh, he's yeah. gone. Oh my God, he's gone. <laughs> I messed up, y'all. I take the L. <laughs> Someone please hand out this L. Okay, I just took a major L. All right. I think uh, one other thing I'm kind of concerned about just a little bit is that he's been uh, a little score heavy. And uh, I'm not passing at least statistically much because I haven't watched any Cavs games yet. So I'm not going to be like anything serious, but just like the numbers are impressive in terms of the scoring. But I'm not sure about how the playmaking is on the on the, the court. So I'll have to take a look at it. Right. And I, I also I, was a Colin Texan guy. Uh, Do you want to add something, Richard? Oh, I was just going to. No, no, you go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. I've already spoken. How's this? It? <laughs> so I definitely was a Colin Sexton guy. Um, he reminded me a lot of Fox, not as a necessarily like a playmaker, but just his uh, competitiveness and willingness to go at a guy. That 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 uh, Westbrook factor is what I'll call it. Um, and I thought, you know, if he was on a team with Kevin Love, I thought maybe he'd be okay as far as setting up guys because he'd at least have a strong person to set up. But I think the situation he's in is kind of playing into his, uh, those low assist numbers that we're looking at. Um, 
hopefully things do get better. Burks has been killing it since he's come over. Um, and hopefully he'll be able to see that he doesn't have to be so score heavy, like you said. Yeah. Uh, Delhi, I don't think is going to help much of that though. So <laughs> I was going to say with Sexton, he, um, he is the weirdest situation. This is my one issue I had with him that was preventing me from putting him above Trey. I was very, very tempted, but I, I've not seen a point guard that bad at playmaking for others in a very long time. Like in high school, he averaged one assist a game. So I, I was truly amazed at that. And there were a lot of games where he just didn't trust his teammates. Granted, at Alabama, they had one other NBA talent on their team. So it's a little bit difficult to trust teammates when you're just head and shoulders above everyone else. So I, uh, that was a weird issue that I just haven't seen. That, that's something that he's definitely never going to be good at. I don't see him ever getting more than five or six, six at the most assists a game. Yeah, I think one thing to point out, though, is that it's probably made sense to put Trey Young above Colin still is because Trey Young was in a similar bad situation at Oklahoma and then was still able to play make decently well, even though he had a lot of turnovers. Right. And that's why how I felt about Trey is that, you know, even though he was gunning and uh, like you said, having a whole lot of turnovers, he was still trying to set up guys. He was doing all the things he was supposed to do. But uh, I, I had another guy ahead of both of them, but we won't talk about that. Oh, you had a couple guys uh, over both of them. On the point couple. guard list, I only had one. <laughs> I had Brooks well, and, uh, yeah. uh fourth, by the way. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you... I mean, he is an eight-point guard, but he's like, he's like what's, what's the size of a Kyrie Thomas? I don't know. I, I always thought Kyrie Thomas was, sh- was short, but I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, six three. So three or four. Yeah. six three. So he's like he's like right there, point guard size slash combo guard size, but yeah. he's not a point guard. Um, no. yeah, we all we, we uh, Mister Frenchman uh, was over him, and uh, for you and I, I liked him, and uh, I might have even thought about putting over him over Colin Sexton for a good amount of time. Um, so we'll get to him later. Um, moving on, do we want to just go skip around now? Cause now we're at like pick nine. Right. Uh, let's see here. Who was next? Yeah, that's the, uh, the big question, right? I'm just going to pull up the Wikipedia it's page. Knox. It's Knox. All right. Knox has been cold. Like Not literally much to say about Knox. <laughs> like he's just been cold, statistically cold. Uh, anything else to say other than that? I mean, I wasn't high on him myself. He he's injured, so it's a little bit difficult to gauge him fairly. Or he was injured. Um, I he still has to be more than one dimensional. That's my only take on him right now. Yeah. Yeah. And even that one dimension isn't great. Yeah. And for now, considering anyway. The situation, considering the situation he's in, I would personally expect more from him. Yeah. It would help a lot if uh, the Knicks actually tried messing around with playing Frank Nindokina. You know, maybe that could help him at least not look bad on defense or whatever. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about Frank right now. I know you're emotional. very you're very depressed emotional. about it. He's been done dirty, in my opinion. It's dirty what they're doing to him. Yeah, it's crazy. it is. And then you see, like, was it last night? They put him in at the end of the third quarter. And let him play through most of the fourth quarter, and com- they completely changed the game. Like he brought it to a five-point game after they were losing by like twenty the whole game. Yep, and I I remember there was a play where he just shut down Spencer Dinwiddie, and Dinwiddie tried driving on him, and uh, he just played him Stone as perfect him. as you could on a drive. And Mitchell Robinson comes over and makes a goal ten for no reason, deflects the oh, man. point guard. He got out of pizza <laughs> a little bit. And out of nowhere, just, no, this is mine. And then they, that, that was really the turning yeah. point that kind of just... I, was say, I think Frank actually had blocked it already. Yeah, like... yeah. It was completely unnecessary. And it sucks because Frank got no... He got nothing for it. Instead, points came out of it and he got penalized. But right. I, I really don't understand what a team that is 8-19 and 19 is doing not playing their... He's still their youngest player, right? Or second youngest, whatever. He's it is. younger than Mitchell Robinson. Yeah. So... <laughs> I just I think you should let him learn. I think he's still one of the better defenders 
from the draft. Let him go yeah. and do his thing. Like, I, I think it's too early to start doing this. <laughs> and the funny part about that happening against the Nets last night is that some of Frank's best games have been against the Nets, and they're one of the teams that was reportedly interested in him um, after it was clear the Knicks don't know what or want to do right by him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause he shut Denwitty and Levert and those guys down earlier in the season. I think he had one of his 16 or 17 point games against them also. Yeah. I think the situation with Frank is they might be tanking so hard and Frank might actually be impacting winning positively to the point where they're like, you know what? We're just not going to play you <laughs> because uh, we're thinking about getting Zion Williamson so we can pair him up with Kevin Durant. Honestly, with the way the Knicks operate, that wouldn't even surprise me. Yeah, I was going to say, like, when he was starting, they weren't necessarily winning, but they were in every game. Yeah. So I could definitely see that being a thing. And uh, knowing uh, uh, Dolan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, pick 10, we have Mikhail Bridges. Uh He's been uh, revolutionary for their team because ever since he subbed into the lineup for Josh Jackson, he's been significantly better. So that's really nice to see, especially considering how Josh Jackson was picked like fourth and uh, Josh Jackson and maybe on the trading block. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything I else to add? Sorry. I, was gonna say, I haven't seen much of Bridges. Um, I've, I've seen the stat lines. I do see he's performing um, about, like you said, better than he was when he was coming off the bench for half a minute at a time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think yeah, he's a good player, but uh, he's in a bad situation also. Yeah, they're also trying to get Zion Williamson, maybe. <laughs> I think Apparently they might be trying to get Frank Milikina. <laughs> that would not be a bad idea. God, if they get Zion over a point guard, or like a playmaker, if they have the first pick, they have to take Archie Barrett. I, we go, I see no way that they don't do that. Okay. I have He's a definitely bit, gonna be up there. <laughs> yeah. I have a different opinion of Zion Williamson as a playmaker, but I will hold that uh-huh. for now. Uh-huh. I will he's hold it. Forward. <laughs> no, I don't think he's a point forward, but he's showing some promise. But I will hold hold that for now. Hold that Let's hard. Let's go back Fair. to the top of the draft real quick. Uh the top, any t- the top of the draft. Yeah. The re- the Part of the reason I never thought about Luca on the Mavs is because after they hired his coach down at Phoenix, I just knew Luca was going to Phoenix. Like it made too much sense. Yeah. See, but I didn't buy into that because that was before the lottery. Because what if they'd slipped to fourth, you know? Right. True. True. Well, what if they slipped to four and then Luca fell like he did anyway? And then they just trade up for him like the Mavs did. Well, that wouldn't have been fun for where we are now. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> it was just one I don't of those like things, that like, alternate reality, so I refuse to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alternate basketball history hub on this podcast. I mean, it's 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 the same way we got Dirk, like a random draft day trade that should or shouldn't have happened, and you end up with a legend. Like it's the second time we've done it. Wait, wait, you end up with two legends, Dirk and Steve Nash. Also oh, I thought I thought you meant from was, this year. I'm like, you're talking Raymond Spalding. I was, <laughs> was going to say you got some news for us. Like. <laughs> yeah, in uh, 1998, two legends. But uh, yeah, yeah, I was in the same boat thinking they were going to pick uh, Luca one just because it made too much sense. Right. Like ignoring the coach thing, the fit. Like I thought they were going to pick Luca before all that, but now, but like after right. that, I was just like, it has to happen. It has to happen. Him and, and Booker would be a deadly combo. But instead, we have um, Igor getting chippy with Mikhail Bridges and <laughs> him being probably a little uh, depressed on the inside about the whole situation. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry I got us off track there a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I'll probably have my fair share of uh, cracks. So moving on to pick number 11, SGA. He's been the guy, not like the guy, the guy, but like he's been a pretty much a revelation for the Clippers. Like taking the starting spot from Patrick Beverly is no joke. Right. Uh, is there anything else to add? Because I personally haven't watched SGA enough to comment on playing ability. Uh, Richard? I have liked SGA. I 
have been really, really surprised at his ability to make jump shots like he could. I thought he wouldn't be able to hit him off the dribble. He's been able to do it. That was by far my biggest criticism of him entering the draft. So he's been really good. Um, interested to see how he is without Patrick Beverly in front of him because obviously Beverly's like, what, 30 already? He's not a long-term piece. So I, uh, I'm very interested to see how SGA does without him in front of him, like in a full-time role. Yeah, he's got a... He's got a lot of uh, promise right now. Uh, moving on to pick 12. Another guy I was a fan of, Miles Bridges. Uh, I'll speak on him since uh, that's my, my local team here. Um, <clears throat> the uh, overall game from him, you can't really say he's been great or bad. He's been a lot of fun, though. Um his dunks electrify the crowd down in Charlotte. Like he's, if the if the Hornets are looking to do some type of trade here to get Kemba some help, he's not going to be included in that trade. I'm going to tell you that. Oh, he's damn um, better I not. Would, I would be shocked if they include him in any type of trade. Um, he's he's athletic. Obviously, he hustles. He makes little plays. Um, and I think as he gets more experience and more time, and after they get Batum or MKG out of his way. Um, I think he's going to start to flourish with the with the starting lineup once he once he gets to, again those guys out of his way. Uh, is that, a hustle guy. Yeah, is that all for Bridges? I, I got one more. I think uh, I think he's been really helped by Tony Parker. I think Tony Parker has done a lot for him. He's just finding him in the looks that really not many other point guards can make, which I did not think I would right. be saying this year about thirty something year old <laughs> Tony Parker. But no, I, I really like his fit on that Charlotte team, which is completely the opposite of what I said in the draft. I thought it was a horrible fit for him. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a terrible fit for him to be in Charlotte. So I'm I'm good that he's proven me wrong. I'm happy I want him that. there badly. I want him there badly. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm so tired of looking at MKG. Like he's not even funny. Yeah, I just I'm I'm kind of sad that the Clippers couldn't have engineered a way to get both SGA and Miles Bridges and then like, I don't know, traded Gallinari or something, even though well, that wouldn't be a good win now move. I just don't understand why they, they could have just taken Bridges and SGA, right? Like they had that. They, they, they had them. Jerome Robinson. They had, no, uh, Robinson was 13. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Cause I just, I did not understand the Jerome Robinson pick, which I, I guess that leads us perfectly into it. I still don't understand <laughs> him. That. I okay, don't understand yeah. how he went the lottery. I don't understand why they chose him. There's a lot of things weird with that one. I know he's a long-term player, but like, I just do not understand that. Yeah, I think we no. can go ahead and say, at least with about the most amount of confidence you can have at this point, he's the Anthony Bennett selection of this draft. <laughs> as close as it <laughs> gets, yeah. Not, he just can't he just can't get on the floor. It's not like he's bad when he's on the floor because we can't judge that. Yeah, but like, did Anthony? I don't know how much Anthony Bennett went on the floor, but like, he lost playing time. I'll oh, tell you, Anthony on, Bell, Bennett's killing it in the G League right now. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Bennett's killing it in the G League. That's all I'm gonna say. So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but Jerome Robinson, I think it's uh it's hard to say because SGA is getting so much playing time. I'm not ready to judge Jerome Robinson because that's a they're one of the top teams in the West right now. So at his position, it's going to be tough for him to get on the floor. And um, and I can say that as sort of a defensive Thornwell at the same time. Uh, just their guard situation. Um, those guys are the type of guys that are going to have an immediate impact in the way that you would want them to to take up those minutes. Yeah, like. I think the weird thing is we had the same concerns about uh, the playing time for uh, Jalen Brunson, and he's managed to carve out the Yogi Ferrell role that Yogi was uh, so famous for last year. So I think that's been a nice development to see that Jerome Robinson hasn't been able to do. So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not he can get that together. The weird thing is he's played like exactly 40 minutes, and uh, he's shot pretty well in those exact 40 minutes. But uh, obviously, that doesn't mean pretty much anything. It's garbage and, time. And it's <laughs> yeah, it's like whenever you're playing the uh, Atlanta Hawks, we decide, you know what? Let's play Jerome Robinson tonight. All right. Uh, skip number 14. 
Uh, you don't want to talk about Michael Porter Jr., the legend? He's, what? he's injured. <laughs> it's just, there's no point. No comment. All right, continue. Um, I have zero frame of reference on how Troy Brown is doing, but I will say that the Wizards are a mess still to an extent. So. I think that's safe to say. Uh, Richard? Not much to talk about him on, but I think soon he'll get some action. I still like his Evan Turner comparison. Uh, mm. Maybe a little bit better of a shooter. But there's been nothing on him. Yeah, he's uh, he's been stroking it. And, you know, the few minutes he's been playing, you know, maybe... Maybe he becomes another Keller Uber for the Wizards somehow, and they luck out again. Um, all right, I think we can just we can do like two. We can do this last controversial pick in the first round. Another one of those Jerome Robinson type of risers, but this one was a bit more justified. Uh, Dante Divincenzo. Hey, I'll take the L on that one. I thought he was going to be horrible. He's actually not been too bad, all things considered. So. I, I, I was okay with what he's what he's done so far. Good for him. He really proved me wrong. I did not think he was worth even picking in the top forty five. Yeah, I wasn't the bad take. Yeah, I wasn't the highest on him either, but I think all things considered, they still should have really, really thought about taking Lonnie Walker or Kevin Herter. Yeah. That's that's what I was gonna say. I thought they would have gotten a guy that was more polished as a as a either a super athletic guy like Walker, like you said, or a guy like Horter, who's a bucket. All right. Uh, moving on to some, uh, on. some immediate impact guys. Uh, let's take a crack at Landry Shamet. Hmm. I hate his form because it triggers me from Parsons flat shot, but, <laughs> but he's actually been capable. Uh, still has, not much room to grow as a defender and he's not a very good defender. So that's always going to be worrisome, but he'll at least, I think what his role is now is pretty much what he's going to be his whole career. That good. He's a good backup point guard. Um, that can shoot the ball. I don't think he's going to be anything crazy. I don't think you ever hear him in a starting lineup for a full year. Yeah, probably not, especially not on like any successful team. <laughs> no, exactly. I think he's fallen into the perfect situation. Uh, because he kind of, like you said, is what he is. He's a guy who's going to come off the bench and give you some buckets. And that's that. All right. Moving on to the, uh, I just want to say real quick, the Warriors selection. Because the Warriors seem to always find these guys in like the late round, late first round somehow. How are we feeling about Jacob Evans the third so far? Eh, he's barely played, but I think he's played less than 100 minutes. I like his ability as a shooter. Obviously, you can't go wrong by going to Golden State as a shooter. So, <laughs> but I, I like his defense too. Uh, I wish he was a bit more explosive. Sadly, can't change that very much now. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, I like him as a bench player long term for them. They seem to be really like underrated at finding that. They found you know Kavon Looney. I really like Damian Jones a lot more than most people. I, I think he still gets too many touches. I think he should only be getting putbacks as his only shots. But they've been really good at finding these guys just to be unknown, whether it be through free agency or through the draft. They're really good at finding these end of bench guys. Like they took the Mavs, their leftover from Quinn Cook. So I think there's uh, there's a lot of hope for Jacob Evans going forward. All right, uh, moving on to a big minutes guy, uh, relatively, if I remember correctly, Omari Spellman. Yep, he's a big minutes guy. Eighteen a game. Um, I, I I like what I've seen from Omari. Um, he's another guy that's in that situation in Atlanta. Uh, his minutes have been somewhat inconsistent because they've had a lot of injuries. Uh, so he's including him, actually. Um, he's shooting the ball as good as you can expect from a, a, a rookie big that's a jump shooter. Um, from threes, particularly. I was, uh, his mid-range shot has not been falling much, which is why he's not getting the playing time. But um, I think he's got room to grow, and but right now he's he's just a energy big coming off the bench for for Atlanta. Anything to add, Richard? No, that's uh, that pretty much summarizes it. I'm not a huge fan of him, uh, but side note, I do like the Atlanta bench. Their upside really like DeAndre Bembry's growth this year. Just wanted to shout him out. Yeah. All right. 
Bibbs, this is your guy, and to a smaller extent, my guy too, Elia Kobo. Yeah, you want to start there? Oh God, um, I'll try my best <laughs> shot. Like I can't really, I don't watch too much NBA games outside of the Mavs, but you know, it's nice to see that he's finally made it back to the big club and that he's not playing the G League all the time. Um, <laughs> He hasn't been shooting very well. He's kind of been in Trey Youngish with the shooting. Uh, I think a nice development to see is that he has like an above like one and a half assist per, uh, assist to turnover, but it's still not like the best or anything. You know, right. uh, still early and all that. Nice to see him just just the fact that he's earning a spot in the rotation is just making me happy enough for now, considering where he was picked and all that. Exactly. So, yeah, for a lot, a lot of the similar things, um, I was disappointed that he didn't get early playing time down in Phoenix. Um, I was glad they sent him to the G League, actually, so he could get some time as the main guy. And he had a few few really good games down there. Um, unfortunately, he's been starting. Uh, he started a few games without Devin Booker, which is kind of pointless as far as me evaluating him, because I want to see those two play off of each other. Uh, which I think has affected his shooting because he's had to take on more of a scoring load. Uh, but hopefully they stick with him in in a, a big capacity. Uh, they did just sign Jawan Evans, who was a, one of my guys last year, um, as well to a two year two way deal. Um, so to see both of those guys on that team, hopefully one of them is able to pop here soon for me, so I can look like I'm smart. Richard, how are you feeling about uh, Elliot Kobo? I'm <laughs> uh, more raw than I thought he was. Um, that's kind of surprised me. He kind of just doesn't know how to run an offense. Not kind of, he doesn't know how to run an offense. That's been pretty surprising to me how he can't figure out when to shoot, when to slash, when to put, when to pass. Uh, that wasn't really supposed to rhyme, but he, uh, he's got, he's got a long ways to go. He, I think he needs to, to kind of fix his form a little bit. I, I think it's a little bit too wide of a stance, but the upside is definitely still there. It's just for him figuring it out. And it's what, December 9th or something like that. Yeah. The day yep. we're recording this spoiler alert. Um, but I mean, if he's still playing like this in March, then I'm worried because most right. guys turn it like they figure it out. They're adjusted to the speed. You know, they they know the offense pretty well. So I think March is going to be my telling point on him for the rookie year. Um, I, I really would like to see what changes he makes, because right now it's obviously a shot isn't falling. That's the biggest weakness for him in my opinion um but if you can la- slim down those turnovers that's also pretty huge right all right moving on to uh another one of our podcast member guys uh richard i think you deserve the right to start off with jalen brunson oh yeah gladly uh let's talk about the game against houston no he uh my my main thing in my scouting report my like one sentence summary was you're not going to see him do anything wrong and you're never going to see him be a star or anything like that. He obviously was the college star at Nova winning fat, what two time, two champions and three, two championships in three years yeah. and winning all, all sorts of awards, but he doesn't do anything wrong. Even on defense, he's like, God, I think he's six, three with like a six, four wingspan. So he's really not got much help there yet. He still is able to use his smarts and he's a decently strong kid. He knows how to position himself and how not to get beat. His worst play was Chris Paul really cheesing him last night. And um, <laughs> where, you know, I'm talking about on the rip through, but it was just a brilliant play by Chris Paul. But it really, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, he's making all the right plays. You don't see him make stupid plays. And I think Rick Carlisle is going to love him. So when JJ retires, you've got yourself the new backup point guard that's going to be minimal turnovers, high three point percentage easy looks and not take dumb looks and force anything. So I'm really proud of what he's done. I think last night was a big turning point for him. Yeah, for sure. I think, like I said, my beef with Jalen Brunson was never, I don't like him as a player or I don't think he can be a good NBA player. It was all like conceptual, like draft philosophy, this. So, you know, I've been pretty glad with how he's been playing as a player itself and I can't be mad or anything. And it's been pretty, uh, uh, I wouldn't say surprising, but like remarkable to see how well he's uh, molded himself into that Yogi Ferrell role, like within like, you know, 20 games. Right. Right. And I think uh, I'm, I'm closer to where Richard was on Brunson. Um, I had him again as my fourth 
point guard behind Ely, uh, Colin, and Trey. Um, he's he's an old man. Like you've got an old man game. He does literally everything that you would want from your point guard. Um, I think that you talked about how after he might take over that role after JJ retires. I'm more concerned that if he's not upgraded to being a starter, that teams are going to be coming after him by the time that that, that decision is being made. Um, and he, cause he, he could be a starter for somebody, I think, in a couple of years. Um, another guy that's physically similar would be uh, Kyle Lowry as far as stature, Kyle th- Thicker, but uh, I think Jalen Brunson, like a team could come after him to just be their floor general if they have scores on the wing or inside that they just need somebody to get the ball to. Yeah, maybe, but um, he might not. He probably won't become a starter just because the Mavs are pretty high on Dennis, and Dennis is finally putting it together, it seems. So it seems like Dennis has really held it down as of late. So we'll see how that future develops. Uh, moving on to pick 36, Mitchell Robinson. Uh, Bibbs, you you watched a lot of Knicks games because of Frank Nilkana guy, so why don't you start? Uh, yeah, Mitchell Robinson, I think the easiest way to size him or to put, put it visually for people is he's young Javal McGee. Like, he'll make a play. Like, last last night, I think he had the uh, – Frank threw up a lob that was, like, two feet behind him, and he just reached back and gently guided it into the hoop when it looked like it was a terrible pass. Um, he'll have – he had, like, a big block where he, like, took it out of some guy's hands and started the fast break. And you'll see plays like that, and you'll be like, oh, my goodness, like, this guy's a monster. But then he'll come back the next play and fumble a ball out of bounds or uh, goaltend a shot that was already blocked type of thing. So yeah. you gotta, you're going to have the good and the bad with him. Um, you hope that he works it out over time and isn't and it's just a factor of his rawness right now. But, uh, yeah, he's a high uh, flash and low flash type of guy. I think the one thing that's nice, though, is at least we don't see Mitchell Robinson on Shocked and a Fool every week. Yeah, that might change. <laughs> yeah. But I don't have. Have we had a situation where he's dribbled up the court and uh, fallen and fell into a teammate? He doesn't. He has not done anything that stupid yet. But uh, okay. he makes some some bonehead plays or messes yeah. up a play that was easy. <laughs> um, Richard, I think y'all summed it up pretty good with Robinson. I mean, he's still really raw, so learning the game for him is going to be huge. Um, that's really what's going to separate him from being Javale. And an actual rim protector, like someone that like better way to put it, actually, that's what's going to separate him from being a Denver and Washington JaVale or <laughs> being the Lakers JaVale, because Lakers JaVale hasn't been too bad. No, not at all. He's finally kind of feels like figured it out. Took mm-hmm. longer than you would expect, but <laughs> I think he's in a good spot right now. All right. Um I'm trying to figure out momentarily whether or not we should talk about Gary Trent. Uh, Do y'all have any thoughts about him? Talk about a different Gary. We know you want to talk about him. Okay, fine. Uh, Even though it's drafted, it's really worth talking about. Oh, there's, there's a guy. There is a, there's a couple, like there's one guy, you know what? Let's talk about that guy right now. He's also a, he was a Houston rocket. Uh, DeAnthony Melton. Okay. My thought. Yeah, he he's he was my guy. Um, he was like in the same group with a uh, Koba, where it's like this guy might be first round worthy theoretically, and uh, the same thing where like he I saw him take over a couple times in the G League, and now I believe he's is he back with the uh, the big club now? Yeah, I think he started the last game. Yeah, I was like, yes, DeAnthony Melton. If like things work out, could be that like off the bench point guard that like defends pretty well against ones and twos and like is kind of high effort, uh, decent feel. And now is actually making his jumpers, which is uh, a surprising development. But if you saw his shooting form changes, it was uh, not entirely completely surprising. So I've been pretty happy with uh, Melton considering everything. And he was definitely a steal at 46. <laughs> no, definitely. I can agree with that. Um, yeah, he's he's getting an opportunity down in Phoenix as well. They've gotten again the, the three three of the guys that I was really high on that were kind of sleeper point guards, Akobo, Melton, and Evans are now all in Phoenix in a situation where they don't have a point guard. So 
um, they all have the opportunity. It's just a matter of one of them seizing it right now. All right. I haven't gotten to see Melton in his starts, though, so I won't talk too much about where he is right now. Fair enough. Um, I think it's that time to talk about the problem. Uh, Gary Clark, my guy, has uh, secured the bag, and I'm very happy about it. And it's going to be lovely to see how he develops with uh, P.J. Tucker's assistance. But um, hopefully the culture will fix itself a little bit in Houston. I wish he would be shooting a little bit better, but, you know, other than that, the defense has been as expected, making some pretty strong rotations, you know, being the problem for as much as he can be for a rookie, and I've been relatively happy. Uh, Richard? I haven't... Um, I I can't say that I was uh, surprised by the fact that Clark has been doing this well, but to do it on a team like Houston, which granted they've been not good, is still pretty remarkable for me. I thought you know like he'd be a end of bench guy who could like maybe soon you know be that versatile dream on roll kind of guy, but it's been a pleasant surprise to see him. Um, to see him doing what he's done. Oddly, he's been getting random DNPs lately. Um, classic Dan Tony kind of thing where, you know, you're hot and you're young. Um, don't get to play. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think he's got to fight through that oddity, but I really like his upside. Um, I think he could definitely continue to be a rotational guy in a winning team. I, I think he just naturally plays winning basketball. Yeah, and one other thing, he uh, overtook your guy that you put over him, Vincent Edwards. So uh, yeah. I'm I was grinning. actually going to say something about him. I was watching over old Purdue games from last year because I was looking at Carson Edwards. And spoiler alert, I'm not a fan. Um, but he uh, he definitely is not the better Edwards. Vincent Edwards looks so good in college. I loved his three and D ability to be a playmaker, and he just hasn't been able to touch the floor. So. That's really sad to me. Um, really wish that uh, that he had been able to play because I was really high on him. It's actually my second highest. The scouting report of him is my second highest uh, viewed article ever. So <laughs> believe that one or not. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Moving on to uh, Mavericks, guys, because, of course, we are all a little biased in that regard. Ray Spalding. Uh, he's been definitely a key player on the Texas legends, I'd say, and it's been nice to see him play well and not have any questions about him, uh, being able to earn playing time at that level. Uh, it seems unlikely if this rate can continue with, uh, the Mavericks winning games for him to see much playing time, but it's still a very promising development. I'd say, uh, Bibbs, you want to go this time? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. He's, uh, uh, I'd love to see him find his way up to the big club, but with the way we're winning right now, I don't expect it to happen um, anytime soon. Um, if it happens, that means that we've got a ton of injuries, which um, hopefully Maxie's back soon and can stay healthy. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've liked what I've seen. I love the clips, and I've, I watched like half of a G League game uh, just to kind of check on him and coast this. Um, and he's hopefully he can continue to polish those skills, like you said, down in down in Frisco or up in Frisco, I guess. Yeah, I I guess my thing with uh, Ray Spalding is I'm gonna have a piece on him and all of them coming out around the new year, like I said earlier. So I can't wait to get a fine uh, close up look at him with all those games that you can find for free on Facebook. So I'm gonna be looking forward to that. Uh, moving on to the Mavs pick number 60, unless, uh, Richard, do you have any thoughts on Spalding that we haven't already said? I know you were a fan. I mean, I was a fan. I just, I haven't been able to watch any Legends games. So All right. I, I have nothing on him. All right. Moving on to another Texas legend, Costas Antetokounmpo. Uh, Richard, as you said, you haven't been able to watch any Legends games. Um, I haven't in any serious capacity been able to watch any legends games either 
I will say that he, I'm pretty sure he has actually carved out a role in the rotation, which considering how he couldn't really do that at Dayton and make an impact is a uh, nice in itself. And, you know, as long as he can make that impact offensively, he made in summer league, which I think he has been, I'm going to be pretty happy for him, but still very salty. We didn't pick Gary Clark. Uh, Bibbs. <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, I was excited about the pick because I uh, I liked I mean I've been following the Ant- Antetokounmpo family since uh, before Giannis was drafted um, and again they're still contending that the youngest brother that's still in high school is going to be the best so we gotta we gotta keep an eye on him but uh, Costas I think like you said it's good that he's been able to crack the rotation down up in Frisco um, because he wasn't at Dayton and. Um, a lot of people said that he shouldn't have come out. Dallas apparently didn't agree. Uh, I liked what I saw from Costas in preseason, uh, just as an energy big and an athlete. Um, he's another guy that I think it's, we got to see him put on some some muscle because apparently they want to play him at like the five. And he's way too skinny for that right now and way too raw. Um, so hopefully, like his brother, he can put on some of that muscle. And uh, who knows, uh, he could be a good potential guy to sneak into the rotation over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think he needs to become very close buddies with uh, Maxi Kleba so he can learn how to play some really good defense at the NBA level. <laughs> and uh, Bibbs, I think it's time to announce that Bibbs is indeed the Maxi Kleba fan club president. So That's correct. <laughs> remember that people, you are not anywhere near the level of Maxi Kleba fan as Bibbs and no one can touch Bibbs. It's not, it's not possible. All right. Moving on to my little personal favorite, uh, considering he was undrafted. Daryl Macon, crisp, Crispy Macon, Macon Buckets, Mr. I am a G League star. Um, definitely putting up the buckets, but um, not the greatest three-point percentage or anything, but he's taking so many. He's taking like a lot of shots, so I'm not too, too worried about it. And the fact that they aren't like a really bad – a team in the G League and like they're fighting is making me pretty happy for uh, him. Obviously, you got to worry about how is he going to adjust to being a role player in the NBA and all this, but it's too early for me to start being too, too worried about it. So hopefully you can just get his shooting numbers up a little on uh, the three point land. Bibbs? I actually haven't gotten to see much of uh, making to, to create an opinion, but like you said, he's been getting buckets at the very least. So that's interesting to see. Um, and uh, hopefully it turns into something for him, a 10-day or something like that down the line. All right. Um, Richard, I just want to give you this last guy before we end this, um, since uh, you were watching a decent amount of TCU. Um, how have you been feeling about Kenrich Williams being a two-way guy for the Pelicans this year? So, admittedly, I haven't seen him since he made his debut the night I was at the TCU game against Eastern Michigan. Uh, but I'm really happy that he got it. TCU has a strong program that they've been building up the last few years. So I'm really proud that they're actually getting uh, NBA caliber players like Desmond Bain will definitely get a chance. Um, I know they've got a couple of top 150 guys coming in next year, but I'm really excited that Kenrich Williams got a chance. Um, he kind of plays big for him for his position, which is a positive and a negative. I feel like that kind of trait doesn't really bode well for long-term success but if you know how to use that as energy and make that just playing unbelievably energetically like kind of how bruce brown has then you can definitely make it work so i'm excited for him all right and with that this has been the third round picks podcast with max levy aka at rangers 669 on twitter which is me uh you can find my work soon hopefully on lockdraft.com and also some previous work over the summer on the Dallas prospect.com. Uh, the Dallas prospect will have hosted their uh, Atlanta Hawks versus Mavs, uh, Luca versus Trey part two uh, live event at Mexico uh, cantina and restaurant in Allen, Texas. And uh, if you ha- had been able to show up, we really appreciate it. Um, moving on to Bibbs, he, you can find him on, uh, Twitter at Adam Bibbs and also at Bibbs corner and his website, bibbscorner.com. Bibbs, any new developments with anything regarding your website or anything in particular? 
nothing on the website right now, but I am working on a, a list for Netflix Life of 30 under the radar television shows or shows that are on Netflix. Uh, so be on the lookout for that if you need to add some stuff to your to your queue. And uh, we can find that Netflix work at netflixlife.com uh, or I usually uh, post a link after I, after I post it over there. All right. And Richard, any developments on MazDraft.com and also and or on your Twitter at MazDraft? Uh, I've been tweeting a lot more than writing um, in a weird situation. Hopefully uh, I'll get more time cleared up in the near future. I've wanted to write something about the Oregon-Houston game. I guess my window's kind of passed on that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping to get something about Oregon, though, because Louis King, Louis King, excuse me, came back yesterday and was really good uh so trying to get something out about that oregon is probably my team that i'm going to be watching the most of this year just because they have by far the most intriguing and odd and also talented roster uh in the country so really interested to keep watching them and conference play starts in like three weeks so that's really exciting for me I would like to contend that I'm going to be watching Gonzaga the most because uh, that block today by uh, Brandon Clark. That was unreal. <laughs> oh, uh, like I've heard grumblings from certain people who have been watching Brandon Clark since before yeah. Gonzaga saying he wasn't a very good defender. So I think it's safe to say that he's changed a little bit and uh, I can't wait to watch him because I'm screaming Mavericks. If you can do anything to get Brandon Clark right now. All the mistakes not picking Mitchell Robinson will be forgiven and all the mistakes for not picking Gary Clark will be forgiven because now we will have another Clark who is a better Clark. <sighs> all right, that's my uh, 20 second Mavs rant. Um, and with that, the third round picks is over. Thank you all for listening. If you have any news you want to share with us in voice messages, you can do that through Anchor. And that's a wrap. See you all soon.